second uh, public seminar today is uh, uh, really, uh, about very important issues of uh, current uh, macroeconomic um, problems, global problems, and uh, we are very happy to have here Daniel uh, Lee and John Gludon, who are the um, <coughs> Uh, who work uh, at uh, International Monetary Fund at the research department. It's uh, uh, the department that, among other things, produces uh, usually twice a year a very important uh, global review, so called World Economic Outlook, uh, that um, summarizes the current trends, the current problems, or mostly macroeconomic problems. And uh, this is a very important and uh, um, survey for, for um, development of the world and of the regions. Uh, both uh, John and Daniel, they graduated from, uh, they did master master uh, programs in the uh, United Kingdom and did the PhD in the United States. So this is, uh, we also have a lot of graduates uh, from NASA that uh, did PhD in the United States and the work uh, joined IMF. We have already talked about the one founded, but there are several of our graduates who work in various departments at the environment, and we are very glad that uh, we have such good connections with IMF and on other issues we did several projects uh, with IMF and some uh, groups within uh, IMF, such as uh, uh, the survey of uh, the crisis that we did in Russia, with each with, uh, along with uh, the people from IMF. And today we uh, present uh, the, uh, the analytical uh, results, the, the, the analytics that uh, now is in this book in two chapters the, about uh, price, uh, commodity price swings and uh, to be in deficits. Uh, uh, I hope those who took macro at some point, macro classes, I at least heard about twin deficit, twin deficit, but I thought uh, macro for several years and Usually it was just some mentioning of these issues, but nothing more because it was not a big problem uh, over many years and now we face this problem to a large extent in many countries. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. So um, we're very glad to be here and thanks for, thanks for coming. I hope you find this uh, useful. So uh, I'm going to be presenting, um, as Natalia said, the uh, one of the chapter, one of the analytical chapters from our this publication that we produced, the World Economic Outlook. And so, just a brief background: the structure of this is that there's it presents kind of the IMF's current forecasts for the global economy, and uh, that's kind of the first two chapters. One takes a global perspective, and then the second chapter takes kind of a regional perspective, look at kind of region-specific issues. And then there's usually either one or two additional chapters that go into more depth, more analysis of specific issues that uh, we think are kind of relevant. And um, Daniel is going to present, uh, after I, I, I present, he's going to present on the commodity price swings and monetary policy, what's the best way for uh, monetary policy to deal with the issue of commodity price swings, which can sometimes lead to big swings in headline inflation. And what I'm going to talk about is what, what's referred to as the twin deficits issue. This is about the relationship between the budget balance and the trade balance. And so this chapter is entitled, Separated at Birth, the Twin Budget and Trade Balances. And uh, this is going to have uh, two components. One is going to be kind of an empirical component of an, the analysis, so it's going to look at some statistical stuff. And then the second is going to be a more kind of theoretical, kind of delve into this using some models and model simulations. So, this is kind of the roadmap for where our presentation is going to go. And I should say, if you have any questions, please feel free to, uh, at any point, uh, you know, interrupt. Uh, raise your hand and I'll, I'll, I'll uh, uh, try to answer your questions in time. So, What's the motivation? Why is this uh, topical? Well, the evidence is out there. Lots of economies, in particular advanced economies, uh, are engaging in fiscal consolidation, fiscal adjustment. It's also true in many emerging market economies. Some are uh, doing this, uh, kind of rolling back fiscal stimulus, in part to uh, build back 
some fiscal space should outturns prove uh, adverse. Or also, though, to kind of reduce some overheating pressures that we see in, in some emerging markets. In the case of uh, advanced economies, of course, the most vivid example of this is what's going on in uh, the euro area today in terms of um, the need uh, to, uh, to uh, try to achieve or have a plan for achieving fiscal sustainability uh, going forward. So the questions that we're going to look at that's all about kind of this issue um, builds actually, well, so this, this, this issue of what happens in response to fiscal adjustment is actually an issue that was looked at in more detail with respect to output, the effect on output, uh, about a year ago in the October 2010 World Economic Outlook, a chapter there, uh, which got a lot of coverage. And there, it, the, the message is kind of unambiguous, is that it may well be the case that you need to, as an economy, engage in fiscal consolidation, but you should be under no illusions that uh, in the short term, that's going to have an adverse impact on growth. Uh, so you may well need to be doing it for longer term reasons, but it's going to have some adverse impact on growth. Um, so that was the finding from that chapter. This chapter, we're going to build on that research agenda and uh, investigate the, the question of this twin deficits. How much does fiscal policy affect the current account? So, and then in what ways? How is the fiscal policy potentially affecting the current account? Is it through the exchange rate? Is it through uh, reducing domestic demand, leading to kind of an income effect and suppressing imports? How is this occurring? Then we're going to explore in, a, in, the, in the situation characterized by the conditions in the global economy that we see today, where there's a move towards simultaneously, lots of countries at the same time moving towards tightening, towards fiscal consolidation, what does that mean in terms of the current account across these economies? It's also the case we see a world that's characterized by constrained monetary policy. This is most relevant in advanced economies, and uh, also a fixed exchange rate for some, namely the currency union that is the euro area. If monetary policy is unable to respond in such a situation, how does this change the relationship potentially between the current account and what fiscal policy is doing? And then finally, we end with kind of looking at how much do the planned fiscal adjustments that economies have put out there, that this is what they're going to do, how much will that planned fiscal adjustment change current accounts around the world? This is also all very closely related to the, a big issue that if you read the World Economic Outlook, which I should say is available on the IMS website, um, all the chapters, uh, one of the key messages is about uh, there's these two rebalancing acts. One has to do with a rebalancing, a movement away from public demand towards private demand. So that's one that's related to fiscal adjustment. And then a second one, so-called of external rebalancing. This is a movement, a uh, 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 growth in domestic demand among economies with current account surpluses and uh, a shifting away from uh, relying so much on current, uh, current account deficit, persistent current account deficit economies to, to provide that kind of fuel for the global economy. So, what do existing studies show? Well, existing studies tend to show that there isn't any clear consensus on the effect of the fiscal balance uh, on, on the current account. So if there is, in the empirical work, it uh, finds a very, usually a, typically a small effect on the order of 0.1 to 0.4. So what does this mean? This means for a one percentage point of GDP improvement in the fiscal balance, a fiscal consolidation, that the current account would respond by 0.1 to 0.4 percentage points of GDP. Now, an issue here with many of these studies, uh, so this, is, this actually, this finding has led to many uh, people asserting that there isn't much of a role for the twin deficits uh, kind of hypothesis, or the twi a twin deficits link uh, in trying to think about what, uh, how external rebalancing might occur. Now, many of these studies, though, are based on what we're going to call the conventional approach. And this is an approach where you take, say, the current account 
and you look at the statistical relationship between the changes in the current account and the changes in the fiscal balance, the actual fiscal balance, or sometimes in what's referred to as the cyclically adjusted primary balance, or CAPB. And this is a, the cyclically adjusted primary balance is the fiscal balance net of interest payments and then cyclically adjusted. So that hopefully it's m removing from it any kind of influence of the cycle that could be confounding kind of the effect of fiscal policy changes on current account changes. So the issue though that we're going to raise with this conventional approach is that often, even if you're using the cyclically adjusted primary balance, you'll find that these different measures of fiscal policy are influenced by non-policy factors. You'll see them improve if there's an asset price boom, because revenues go up, just automatically. And of course, in a period of an asset boom, we would expect there to be more of a current account deficit, usually. And so that would tend to generate a negative uh, relationship there. Um, so, uh, an example of that would be uh, Ireland in the run-up uh, before the crisis, where there were you know, lots of uh, appreciation of assets, and at the same time, you know, the, fit, the fiscal position looked quite good. Um, it's also the case that fiscal policy, even if you, say, remove kind of these cyclical factors, it can be the case that fiscal policy, of course, is responding to the business cycle. And so this leads to an issue of uh, that there could be an omitted variable in the background that's driving both the current account and the fiscal balance. And so that, it, so that any correlation that you see between these is reflected not of an underlying structural relationship, but rather of uh, this third variable in the background driving both. Uh, so, for example, fiscal policy, if, the business, if the economy is booming, fiscal balances will tend to look good. But at the same time, it's typically the case that then the current account is usually moving more towards deficit. Again, a negative relationship there. Um, an example of uh, this, well, would be, uh, say, Finland in 2000, where we have uh, the uh, Finns, uh, engaging in some contractionary policy to reduce overheating in the economy. Uh, so this is actually kind of a deliberate policy response. So when the, when the, the economy is overheating, we try to engage into some, some uh, contraction that's going to uh, reduce uh, the, the overheating pressures. In particular, this is relevant for Finland because uh, they're unable to they don't have an independent monetary policy at that time. And then finally, the fiscal policy change can actually be a response to current account developments. So basically, this is kind of a reverse causation. We can see movements in the current account that then drive movements in fiscal policy. This, all of these things may lead to some bias. Uh, this last one in particular, we have an example from uh, 1983 for France. When we look at that case, we see... Uh, that the finance minister at the, t at the time, actually we have you know, some explicit uh, speeches that he's uh, given in some interviews, uh, where he says that we, France has to engage in fiscal consolidation in order to uh, reduce the current account deficit. So, what's our, back, what's our approach? So our approach here is basically, instead of using the cyclically adjusted primary balance or the actual fiscal balance, we're going to instead try to identify deliberate fiscal policy changes using what's sometimes referred to as the narrative approach that was pioneered by Romer and Romer in a 2010 American Economic Review article where they look over for the United States the set of congressional records to try to determine uh, in the debates uh, about different legislation if certain tax changes were provoked by changes in the economy at large or were actually uh, truly kind of unrelated to what the developments in the economy. Um, this is going to use a data set uh, that, as I mentioned before, comes from this uh, start, as a starting point, the 2010 October uh, World Economic Outlook. 
Uh, this data set is a data set of action-based fiscal consolidations. And in this data set, we have for 17 OECD countries, uh, over the period 1978 to 2009, we, can, we find fiscal consolidations that are motivated by a desire to reduce the budget deficit. So these are fiscal consolidations that are unrelated to kind of what's going on in the economy at large. They're not, say, counter-cyclical policy responses to the economy. Uh, so an example of that would be uh, the, in 1993, the United mm -hmm. States passed what's called the Omnibus Reconciliation uh, Act. Was it? Uh, omnibus Budget Reconciliation I'm just conferring that, that I have the, the name correct. The Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act, where Clinton at the time specifically says that this is, you know, we want to uh, reduce our uh, budget deficit today to open up kind of uh, possible uh, greater opportunities for long-run growth in the future. Um, we're going to take this data set as our as our, as our starting point, and then we're going to enlarge it to include fiscal expansions. So one uh, thing that the previous data set didn't have is it didn't have these fiscal expansions. And that's kind of, uh, uh, you know, one of the contributions we're making here. So how are we going to investigate this? We're going to use a statistical framework similar to what Romer and Romer in 2010 in their AER article did. It's a very straightforward uh, regression framework where we're basically going to take the change in the current account for country I at time T and regress it on a fixed effect for uh, the country and a time fixed effect to account for kind of, uh, kind of global correlations. And then uh, the change in the current account, two of its lags. And then this is going to be our fist, the change in our fiscal policy stance. So this is our fiscal policy measure here, this delta F. So we're going to take the contemporaneous value of that in two lags. And it's in this model then that we use these gammas, and then we're going to you know, look at the impulse responses to this. That's going to tell us how we think the current account will respond to the particular uh, measure of fiscal policy that we're interested in. And then we're going to complement this with, uh, by looking at some cases where, that don't necessarily have exact matches in the history uh, so far, but we're going to explore kind of the relationship between fiscal policy and the current account through some models. And in particular, we're going to use the IMS kind of workhorse model, which is this, it's called here GIMF, and this stands for it's the Global Integrated Monetary and Fiscal Model. So, any questions so far? No? Okay. So this is kind of our key empirical result. And what we find is that fiscal policy changes, they have a large and long-lasting effect on external balances. And we contrast here the kind of impulse response or kind of response, dynamic response we see uh, if we were to compare the action-based approach, which is our approach, using this narrative, going through all these documents and uh, looking for kind of cases, uh, these are, I should, I should have mentioned this before, these are uh, things like OECD economic surveys, these are IMS staff reports and the like, all of these things that kind of document kind of what's going on at a particular moment in time and what are the underlying motivations that fiscal policymakers have for undertaking the um, policy actions that they do. And we're looking in particular for those policy actions that are unrelated to those three factors that I mentioned before, that there's not some non-policy thing that's going to be driving the fiscal policy change. It's not going to be the cycle, and it's not going to be the current account. So that's that action-based approach. And we compare that to what we get into the conventional approach. In this case, we're using the cyclically adjusted primary balance uh, taken from uh, some work, by, a famous work by Alessina uh, at Harvard and Ardania, where they find, actually, that fiscal policy contractions lead to growth, so so-called expansionary fiscal contractions. And that was one of the, the results that was confronted by, uh, by the analysis in the October 2010 WIO, where we don't see that. We see contractionary contractions. 
In this case, with respect to the action-based approach, you see we get it on impact about a point, uh, two uh, percentage points of GDP improvement for a one percentage point of GDP uh, improvement in the fiscal balance. That's the current account. moves more into surplus. After about a year, it's actually achieving basically what its, its uh, maximum kind of effect is, and that's about 0.5 percentage points of GDP. And notice how persistent that is. And I should mention here that these fiscal policy changes that we're talking about here, these are permanent fiscal policy changes. So, for example, uh, to improve the fiscal balance, it might be, say, something like uh, raising tax rates in a permanent fashion. So tax rates go up from 20% to, say, 22%. Uh, or spending is cut permanently, um, something like that. And so we see in response to that, you get this comparatively large uh, effect. So for a one percentage point of GDP improvement in the fiscal balance, we see the current account move into surplus by 0.5 percentage, uh, percentage points of GDP. If you were to instead use the conventional approach, we see basically very little. So one year after the policy, we see an improvement of about 0.1 percentage points of GDP, but that's quickly undone, and we see basically nothing as we go forward. I should mention these dashed lines are indicative of the 90% confidence bands that uh, surround this estimate. So how is this occurring? Well, one of the channels by which this improvement in the current account is occurring is through the contraction in economic activity. And this is reducing, say, imports, and consequently improving the current account balance. So we see that when we look at the effect of, say, an action-based policy change on real output or real domestic demand. And you see here in the blue lines that uh, we see that this fiscal consolidation is contractionary. So uh, on the case of output, it's going to fall by about 0.5%. And in the case of domestic demand, it falls at the year after by about 1%, and then kind of recovers a little bit to have kind of a more medium-term uh, reduction of about 0.75%. By contrast, if you, you were to use this conventional approach, this is this uh, expansionary fiscal contractions you see with the red line. And of course, we're arguing that that uh, positive response of output is actually indicative of some problems with their... Uh, approach, that basically they're picking up the business cycle here. So, what happens to saving and investment? Well, because of course the current account can be decomposed as saving minus investment, and uh, here we have uh, the blue lines are saving responses, and you can see national savings improves in response to a fiscal policy uh, uh, improvement, a fiscal balance improvement I should say. And so that improves by about 0.4% of GDP. Uh, GDP. Uh, it also does an improvement under the uh, conventional approach, slightly lower, uh, but roughly very similar. But where these two approaches differ quite a bit is in what you see as the estimated response of investment. Here we see investment go down quite a bit when we use the action-based measure. And investment falls in the year after by about 0.3%. That recovers a bit, but kind of levels out just uh, under minus two, or just above minus two percentage points of GDP. By contrast, when you look at the conventional approach, you see private investment actually goes up. And it's this, the fact that investment actually goes up, this little, the wedge here is that current account response. That's why that's so small. So what happens to exports and imports? This is another way to uh, talk about what, uh, what, could, what underlies movements in the current accounts. We have savings minus investment. In this case, we have exports minus imports. Well, uh, from now on, I'm just going to be focusing on the effect of our action-based measure. Hopefully, uh, demonstrated to you that there's a, uh, an important difference in the kinds of estimates that we're getting from these two different approaches. In the case of exports, we see uh, exports actually rise. So it's not all bad news. It's not all import compression as a result of domestic demand contraction. We see uh, imports do fall by about uh, 1%. These are real uh, imports. But exports also rise uh, by about a uh, half percent. So what underlies, what drives this export response? Why are exports improving? Well, it has to do with what's happening in prices. 
in particular exchange rates. We see the real exchange rate actually depreciates with the fiscal contraction. It de depreciates by about 1% and kind of it's persistently depreciated uh, below that kind of where it was before. What's behind this real exchange rate depreciation? Well, it's partially a nominal exchange rate depreciation, which is quite sharp on impact and then kind of rolls back slightly. But it's also domestic relative prices, meaning say the difference between the price level abroad and the price level at home, actually falls. This means that domestic prices are falling relative to uh, foreign prices. And this makes uh, the domestic economy more competitive. Uh, and what's underlying this change in uh, relative prices? It's kind of a relative disinflation, you might call it. Well, it's unit labor costs are actually falling in response to the fiscal contraction. So that's kind of a summary of all of our empirical results. Uh, and then now I can get into a bit about uh, what about the case where uh, we have a, a world that's characterized by simultaneous tightening, which is something we don't have here. This is each economy is doing its own fiscal contraction. And also, what if we have monetary policy that's constrained, which doesn't characterize the, uh, you know, the entire period over which we estimate these models, uh, which was 78 to 2009. And in that case, we need to go towards uh, kind of simulations. And that's what we've got here. So what we see here are kind of the impulse responses for a one percentage point of GDP fiscal consolidation that um, uh, for a small open economy, and in this case, this is going to be uh, calibrated to look like Canada. Uh, this is, again, using that kind of workhorse uh, uh, IMF uh, economic model, the GIMF. Uh, so what do we see? Well, if monetary policy is unconstrained, we actually see a response remarkably similar to what we saw in the empirics. So that if there's a permanent fiscal consolidation of 1% of GDP, we see an improvement in the current account. And on impact, that's uh, and a year after, it's about 0.5% of GDP. That actually rises a bit in the simulation to be, uh, in the medium term, about 0.75% of GDP. So it's a little bit larger than what we saw in the empirical result, but still, uh, you know, comparatively close. Um, we also see um, underlying that, you know, there is still this uh, contraction in GDP and there is still some fall in, in domestic relative prices. That's the blue line here. In the case of constrained monetary policy, so this is if the policymaker, if say in response to the fiscal consolidation, suppose the central bank wants to kind of ease the pain a bit and engage in some monetary loosening in response. Well, in the case of constrained monetary policy, they can't do that. That's the assumption, that they, they're unable to, say, reduce rates uh, either because they're already at the, say, the zero lower bound or uh, because they have, say, a fixed exchange rate arrangement or currency type arrangement. What you see is that the current account response is actually remarkably similar. I mean, these are basically indistinguishable, whether you have constrained or unconstrained monetary policy. However, the way in which this change in the current account occurs is different. When you have constrained monetary policy, you actually get a larger uh, contraction of GDP. So it hurts a bit more. And associated with that, you actually get a larger fall in domestic relative prices because you no longer have the nominal exchange rate moving. And so it's just overall more painful. Uh, now, these are both act, uh, assuming that the actions are taken in isolation. But what if everybody around the world is engaging in, say, a one percentage point of GDP fiscal consolidation? Well, what we see is that for Canada, it's basically you know, no response. Nobody's current accounts is going to be moving in this case. Because current accounts are all about relative positions. And if everybody's doing the same policy action, there's no relative difference. There's no change in the relative positions. And so you can see that that means very little. Now, in this case, there's actually a slight uh, uh, deterioration of the current account, and that has to do with some particular parameterizations in terms of the mix of, say, tradables and non-tradables for Canada. But the overall message here is that 
There's just no, no real response, no improvement in the current account in response to a fiscal consolidation if everybody's doing it. But then the bad news, uh, even worse news, I suppose, is that this is also entailing with a much larger uh, negative contractionary response for GDP. Uh, which is also not surprising, because basically by everybody doing this at the same time, they've cut off any kind of offsetting kind of growth uh, effects from boosting their exports. And uh, that means then that the adjustment has to occur mostly through domestic uh, contraction. Now, since again, everybody's doing it at the same time, the response of relative prices, not much. It's pretty flat, right? Because everybody's doing it again at the same time. So this doesn't uh, bode very well for kind of a case where, again, if everybody is moving in the same direction, uh, it, it, you know, that if everybody is doing it in the same direction in the same size, you're going to get no real kind of external rebalancing. Now, in the current uh, conjuncture, we have that uh, there are planned fiscal adjustments around the world, mostly in advanced economies, but they're all of slightly different sizes. So this means that there may be scope for differences in current account responses across economies. And that's what we're going to see here. So these are the planned fiscal adjustments on the left. So this is based on, uh, you know, we can talk to all of our uh, uh, colleagues in, at the, on the various country desks in the IMF and ask them what's going on in terms of planned fiscal actions uh, in your economies from now until 2016, so say over the next five years. And what we see is, and we, we take this, this information and feed this into our uh, model of the global economy where there's six regions. Here, the U.S., Japan, Germany, the Euro area, excluding Germany, because we're in particular interested in kind of the relationship between Germany and the Euro area, excluding Germany. Also, emerging Asia, and then the rest of the world which is kind of a mix of uh, advanced and uh, 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 emerging economies. So what we see is that, you know, overall, kind of, if you were to just look at on the face of it, the, uh, the plans, these are all consolidations, these are all improvements in the fiscal balance. The U.S. is the largest, followed closely by uh, the euro area, but the mix of consolidatory measures that are undertaken is different. So in the U.S., most of this is just exit from stimulus. So they have temporary stimulus and it's expiring. And then there's a smaller component of that. This is in the red bar here. It's about 1.75% of GDP that's due to new permanent measures. So these are things that improve revenues, things that reduce spending overall. Uh, in the case of the euro area, excluding Germany, this, that component, that permanent, new permanent measures, component is much, much larger. And similarly, we can see that that mix of uh, temporary kind of exit from stimulus versus new permanent measures is different across all these economies. And not surprisingly, perhaps, it's that difference in the new permanent measures that's going to be very closely related to differences in the effect of this fiscal consolidation on current accounts across economies. And we see that over here on the right. So here we have the long-term effects of this fiscal adjustment, assuming this all occurs you know, as planned uh, simultaneously across economies. They're each doing their own uh, kind of uh, plans, but it's all occurring simultaneously. This is this long-term effect of this. If each one of them were able to do their action on their own, without uh, any, but any other regions uh, doing, sim doing fiscal consolidation, we would see improvements in these, each of these regions' current accounts on the order of what the blue bars are showing. And so you can see, we get, uh, not surprisingly, since everybody's engaging in fiscal consolidation, we see improvements in their current accounts if they were doing these actions on their own. What's also interesting is that the height of these kind of improvements in their current accounts is related to the mix of uh, permanent versus temporary measures. You can see here, most of emerging Asia's uh, uh, fiscal consolidation arises from exit from stimulus. And so, consequently, the current account improvement relative to 2010 
uh, over the long term of this consolidation is pretty small. Whereas the improvement for, say, Euro area excluding Germany is quite large, that red uh, component as a share, you get much larger uh, improvement in the current account. And then perhaps most interesting is what if all of these things occur simultaneously? That's the yellow bars here. That's the global action. And what you see, what do you see? You see that Germany's fiscal, sur uh, excuse me, current account surplus uh, gets smaller. Uh, the euro area excluding uh, Germany's uh, current account deficit uh, improves. Uh, we see more of a move towards surplus there. So what this is indicative of is actually we see some intra-euro area rebalancing. So persistent current account economies like Germany, their current accounts are, re are being reduced, their surpluses are being reduced, and persistent current account deficit economies like uh, many economies outside of Germany but within the euro area, uh, their current accounts improve. We see more uh, uh, movement uh, towards surplus. In the case of emerging Asia, which has typically, uh, well, in recent years, been a, an area of persistent current account surpluses, those, that, uh, those surpluses are reduced. That's what we see here, this the yellow bar. In part because they're not engaging in as much new permanent fiscal measures uh, as the rest of the world. And so we see that reflected here. Um, interestingly, the U.S., which is a, per, a persistent current account deficit economy, actually may see their current account deficit widen as a result of this pattern of fiscal consolidation. And why is that the case? It's because they're engaging in comparatively less permanent measures, as opposed to exit from stimulus, than other economies. And so, consequently, there may be some widening of that. So, Overall, then, the, this is just a concluding slide that kind of summarizes uh, the, the set of results. So we find, unlike uh, much of the uh, existing literature, that there's a substantial response of the current account, of external balances to fiscal adjustment. The, the good thing is that it's not all because of the fall in domestic demand resulting from a, consol a fiscal consolidation. It's not only imports falling, it's also exports rising. And why is that the case? It's because the real exchange rate actually tends to depreciate. So this is a case where uh, a policy action to, say, reduce overheating, say, uh, if it was monetary policy, you would raise interest rates. And raising rates, of course, tends to appreciate the real exchange rate. But in this case, you can reduce overheating by engaging in contractionary fiscal policy, and that will actually tend to depreciate the exchange rate. So that has kind of this offsetting kind of property, which is uh, interesting. Now, if the nominal exchange rate is fixed or monetary policy is constrained, we see external adjustment just as large. Remember, it was the same size in those simulations, but it's a more painful adjustment. And what we see with current plans, well, they're going to tend to lower the euro area imbalances lower emerging Asia surplus, but also potentially widen the U.S. curve account. So, so that's kind of, that's it. Any, <laughs> any questions about this? The analysis? Or? So what should the United States do? do. <laughs> so what should, what should the United States do? Well, so one thing is that, of course, uh, the uh, what happens to the current account is not the only goal of fiscal policy. So that's the first thing, right? Fiscal policy has many uh, goals. Uh, the analysis would suggest that if, the, if a primary goal is reducing the, the, the current account deficit, which it may not be, uh, then uh, additional permanent fiscal consolidation, credible medium-term fiscal consolidation, is what's required. But I wouldn't take from this necessarily a policy recommendation. This is kind of just, this is the analysis. You can make of it what you will. And do, do you do it in your research um, in a certain way that some countries do it, this policy in the period A, and next countries do it the same policy but next period, like next year or next five years? 
Will uh, the situation in the first country and in the second country worsen, uh, or it will be the same? Because basically, that's contra globalization rule, <laughs> if to say like that. So basically, in some sense, uh, let me just restate what I think uh, you're getting at. Is let's say we have a case where there's uh, kind of staggered changes in fiscal policy. Right. So one economy, so so we kind of take turns. It's like that. Okay, you do your fiscal adjustment first. And then I'll get a little bit of an export boost, and then and then okay, now I'm on firm ground. So then you can do yours. <laughs> okay, um, there is a dynamic aspect to all of this, and so um, what I what we can take from the analysis, I think, is that um, there may there may be you know some some uh, validity to, to to this in the following sense, because if we take so each one of our impulse responses represents, you know, new information uh, that's revealed. If all, of, if, if basically the future path of all these plans is revealed today for all economies, then it's not clear that that's any different than engaging in simultaneous fiscal consolidations. It's got to be kind of, you know, I mean, these are kind of, you know, surprises in some sense that are occurring over time. Uh, that leverage that difference. Why might that be the case? Well, if everybody kind of knows that five years down the line, you know, country B is going to consolidate after country A has consolidated, then that feeds through via, you know, expectations to kind of things today. So it's, you know, it's not 100%, it doesn't map e exactly the, the situation you're talking about to what we see, uh, what we've kind of analyzed here, but there may be some scope for thinking about this kind of issue. I don't know, Daniel, do you have any? Yeah, um, I think that's a very interesting question, and we, we didn't look at it, but in fact, uh, if you read this book, uh, you're going to see that one of the messages there is that countries uh, like the United States should put in place plans to, to reduce their budget deficits over the medium run, and therefore, they, they don't, if they do that credibly, they don't have to cut government spending and raise taxes today as much. Uh, on the other hand, there are some countries where they don't have the choice. They're up against the wall by the financial markets. They have to cut spending today. So, in fact, uh, you can see this kind of staggered scenario coming through in some of the, the analysis. So it would be interesting to do a simulation uh, of this kind of pattern of, of one country waiting and, and then the other country doing it now and what, what that would do. Uh, maybe that would be less painful, in fact. So, so maybe maybe that's that's a good good reason for, for this kind of policy advice uh, that we hadn't thought of. So thank, thanks for that question. Yeah, it's a good good example of potential multi benefits from multilateral cooperation, which is uh, something we're very interested in at the IMF. <laughs> Any other questions? No, no not not directly related to relations. Yes, so, okay, so what we see is that the current fiscal plans do do something towards uh, improving the situation, uh, but uh, they don't, you know, address all of the kind of issues. As we saw, you know, the U.S. Uh, current account uh, balance, it may actually, the deficit may get bigger. Uh, that's the contribution of this pattern of fiscal, um, the, the currently uh, fiscal plans may have. Um, I don't think, so what we want to get at here in this paper is just that when thinking about what's happening with external rebalancing, you actually need to think also about what's happening with internal rebalancing. Because these things are actually very, very much linked. And that's kind of what we're kind of hoping to bring to uh, bear when, uh, you know, policymakers are taking their decisions. Um, so it's clear, though, that uh, I think uh, the U.S., uh, uh, if 
there were a more credible kind of medium-term fiscal plan, that that would, you know, contribute to not just fiscal sustainability, but also may contribute something towards reducing kind of its uh, kind of persistent current account deficit, which would help ameliorate this kind of external uh, imbalances issue. Um, which, uh, as is discussed in the earlier the, the chapters one and two, is kind of a bit stalled right now. I don't know, Daniel. Do you have any? Uh, yeah, just one more thing. That, as John said, it's going to take more than fiscal policy to address the kind of imbalances you, you discussed, and in particular, if in advanced economies uh, there's a lot of uh, deficit cutting going on, that's going to that's going to play one role through the channel. He said but it's also going to reduce growth in the short run. Yeah. So if we want this rebalancing to happen in a more uh, pleasant way, then the other countries, uh, on the other side of the equation, the big current account surplus countries like China, they, they can do some policies uh, to help raise uh, growth. And these, these are, for example, structural policies, but we don't look at these in this, but I'm broadening the discussion a bit. So for China, for example, there's various, um, microeconomic measure they can take to reduce household saving, uh, reduce uh, uncertainty by, by, of households, maybe providing more health insurance, these kind of things, and then they won't save as much and consume more. And by definition, if they, they consume more in China, they'll be importing more from the rest of the world, including the deficit countries like the US. So potentially this would, uh, this kind of package of the, the painful fiscal consolidation, but also these kind of growth enhancing Structural reforms could, could be uh, could be the solution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just had a clarification question. In the U.S. case, you are are you including the are you assuming that the super commission will actually carry out ah, its job? Yes. Yeah, so, what are we exactly assuming in terms of U.S. policies here? Because it seems like if they do that, then that actually is a credible medium-term consolidation, right? Yes. So, uh, this does not include that, because that's not been agreed yet, exactly what mix that's going to take. So, uh, what this does include is the plans that uh, are released as part of the economic report of the president in February 2011. Now, that may sound a little bit stale, but it's actually the case that the, the U.S. desk has done some analysis of the, uh, the plan that was passed as part of the debt ceiling deal in early August uh, and uh, found that the overall budgetary impact of that plan would be quite similar to what had been proposed in, in February uh, 2011, at least with respect to the first half of that, uh, that act, which was kind of, uh, you know, there was like, I think, was it 800 billion? Uh, upfront kind of uh, changes, and then the super commission is going to do some additional stuff over and above, uh, which is supposed to be yeah about 1.5 trillion dollars worth of additional uh, measures. Uh, but the the initial set of you know cuts and policy changes uh, uh, that were kind of the down payment, if you will, on this plan, uh, those are kind of would be kind of roughly similar to to this. So. That's kind of so. I think of this. Think of this as telling you kind of where things are at in August 2011. I think. Okay. You don't even happen by chance to run it, assuming the super commission works. Uh -huh. We get into the black, did you? <laughs> That's a good question. We How didn't. How much would it take? How much would it take? How much would it take? Well, um, so this is a you know uh, the the current account here is. Uh, uh, Worsening by about what is that about 0.4 percent I think of GDP um, under the, this current set of plans with the global action. So we can kind of if we use our 0.5 we can back out. Well, that's like a additional roughly. Uh, we know that that's going to be an additional like 1 percent of GDP additional fiscal consolidation in terms of permanent measures, and. Uh, that's this over this kind of time frame, and will that 1.5 trillion dollars uh, potentially be that? It could be. It could actually be. Maybe it's enough to to push this over over. Uh, but then that has knock-on effects to everybody else, right? 
some of these guys' uh, surpluses are going to have to be reduced, though. So then what we should do is that we should have a Okay. Well, thanks very much. And so now I'm going to hand over to... Can I give you this? You want to use this? Okay. Uh, to Daniel, who's going to present uh, on the... He's uh, going to use a, a, a new kind of presentation software that we're experimenting with. Yeah, you're the guinea pigs. <laughs> um, on uh, commodity prices and a monetary policy. staying uh, so late, uh, and then we've had a long day, and uh, I'll make this punchy. Uh, it's a slightly less uh, sort of uh, detailed uh, academic presentation, so hopefully we'll have some fun. Uh, this is on what is the relationship of the swings in oil and food prices, what's the impact of that on inflation, and how should central banks respond when they see these kind of fluctuations. And so it's called... Uh, Target what you can hit, and I'll explain why in a moment. So we're going to do two things. First thing is we're going to look at how uh, what has happened to inflation recently in response to these big swings in, in commodity prices. And secondly, uh, we'll do some theory simulations to look at the optimal monetary policy response. So here are the stylized facts. The facts: uh, commodity prices are volatile and unpredictable. So here's some evidence of, of that. This is a real price of fuel, oil, natural gas, uh, sort of index we have at the IMF. And as you can see, it went up sharply you know, during 2008, and then it collapsed in the Great Recession, and now it's gone back up. Right? And, and food prices in blue here, that's an index of wheat, you know, uh, corn, raw agricultural commodities, that's also gyrated wildly. So they're very volatile. The second thing is they're very unpredictable. So as you'll see here in, in the, the wheel, we have projections for oil prices, uh, food prices, all these kind of commodities. And we, we've been doing this for a while, so if you dig up all the past issues from your library and you plot these on the chart, you'll be able to compare how well we predicted with what actually happened. And the black line is what actually happened, and the dashes show you how way off we were. So if and we don't even do these forecasts ourselves. We've given up on that for some time. We take these straight from the financial markets. People who have money on the line, who are trying to do their best to, to guess where this thing is going to go. So it's very difficult to predict. Right? That's the second stylized fact. Now, we also find in this uh, chapter that commodity prices have the greatest effect in emerging and developing uh, markets. Inflation in advanced economies doesn't really respond much to these kind of international shocks. And there's three reasons we identified. There's higher pass-through, so if an international uh, price of wheat goes up, then food prices in the home economy go up a lot more. And the pass-through is bigger in emerging markets. Secondly, uh, well, food is a much bigger share of a household's basket, consumption basket. So. The CPI is the price of that total basket. If half of that is food, well, of course, the basket price will go, jump up a lot more with the commodity prices. And this is a, a last factor, which is more subtle uh, and is particularly interesting. When food prices go up, uh, people will raise their wage demands from their employers if they think that that means that inflation and costs of living are going to go up permanently now for a long time. And they might think that if they think the central bank is not very serious about reducing, uh, offsetting this increase in the cost of living by tightening monetary policy. So we interpret this as less credible monetary policy in these emerging and developing economies, leading to these second round effects. You may have heard of this first round versus second round effect on wages and other, other non-food products. So here's some evidence for these three points. Uh, first of all, uh, higher pass-through. 
Here's the estimates we've done using regressions we explained in the, in the chapter. Uh, the international price increase, if it goes up by 100%, doubles, then the price of food in the home economy, in emerging markets, goes up on average only 30%. But in an, an advanced economy, that's even smaller. It's less than 20%. So the pass-through is much bigger in emerging markets. Now, why might the pass-through be less than 100%? Well, uh, we don't eat the wheat, right? We don't eat raw flour either. To get flour from wheat, you have to put in a lot of labor and different... You're no longer just looking at the price of that. You're looking at all of the, the, the labor then produce the bread, there's even more going into the mix. So it dampens the effect of a price increase uh, in wheat on the effect on, on bread. But why might it, this be even less important in an advanced economy? Because in advanced economies, we don't just eat bread. Uh, we eat you know, something like Wonder Bread, which is what you get in the supermarket. It's got all this fancy packaging and advert advertising and and you, you're actually paying for a very small amount due to the wheat international prices. So that's maybe why in advanced economies, when the price of wheat goes up in an international market, the price of a loaf of Wonder Bread doesn't go up much. And so it doesn't show up in the CPI as much. Low pass-through. Now, a uh, second uh, explanation, the food share in the consumption basket. You probably know uh, these numbers. Roughly speaking, 30, one third on average of an emerging or developing economy uh, household's consumption basket, about one third of that goes to food. But in an advanced economy, it's, it's again, it's uh, less than 20%, it's about 17%. So that has a smaller effect on inflation through that channel. And as, as a result of this, not surprising, during the, that price spike in 2008 when food prices showed up, well, the food component of inflation, this is the food share times food inflation, that contributed a lot more to inflation in emerging and developing than in advanced economies. So it mattered more, as we'd expect based on those uh, earlier things. And here's the interesting thing on expectations. Here we used, we wanted to look at this idea that in emerging markets maybe there's less credibility and therefore inflation expectations are less well anchored. And inflation expectations, if they go up, people ask for higher wages and that just creates a cycle of rising costs. And that, that's, that's something that um, you might have if the central bank is less credible. So that was our sort of thought. Then the hypothesis was, we took that to data on inflation surveys, consensus economics, you may be familiar with that. They publish a survey every six months from many economies. And they ask people, professional forecasters, what they think inflation is going to be for each of the next five years. And so what we looked at, it was, if there's a surprise in inflation this year, inflation surprisingly goes up, does that lead them to expect that inflation is now going to be higher for all the, the future years? Because if they do that, then that's evidence that inflation expectations are not well anchored. The, the contrast to that is if there's a surprise in inflation today and you know that the central bank is serious about stabilizing inflation, you shouldn't think that there's going to be any change in inflation three or four years down the road. The central bank will just squash that. They won't allow that to happen. That would be if you thought the central bank was really credibly committed to, to inflation stabilization. So we do a regression. I can give you more details if you're interested, but essentially the results are that a surprise of inflation today has a much bigger effect on inflation expectations over the future in emerging economies than in advanced economies. There's, they're very well anchored, these expectations, in advanced economies. Uh, we did a few more slices of the data, and we found that in emerging and developing economies, there are some big differences. For example, based on whether the, the emerging market is targeting inflation explicitly as a central bank with an inflation target, turns out that in these kind of countries, the uh, expectations are much better anchored, more like in advanced economies. So not all emerging markets are different. Our interpretation of this is that the credible sort of uh, credibility that you get with, with really communicating as you do in, in IT regimes, that may be, have something to do with it. And really the purpose of these stylized facts are to motivate the model we're going to use now to look at what the optimal monetary policy response is to these kind of shocks. So that's what we're going to do next. Right, just summarizing. There's a much bigger effect in advanced, uh, in emerging economies. 
Okay, so here's the model part. We're going to use a small open economy model. You've probably seen these types in your courses. Something like a new Keynesian model. It's got an IS curve, a Phillips curve. Uh, this is ringing. I can see people nodding. So, And uh, a welfare loss function. Central bank doesn't like inflation volatility. Doesn't like output volatility. It also doesn't like, we, we have this, it doesn't like changing interest rates much. That You'll see that in some of the books, like Woodford. Anyway, so the, the objective of the central bank is to minimize inflation and output volatility. What we're going to really focus on is whether they should be trying to minimize something we're going to call core inflation, which excludes uh, food prices, or whether they should be just um, trying to stabilize CPI. And what, what are the macroeconomic consequences of, of this choice, whether they target core or headline inflation. And, and the, the innovation of our model, which I'm going to show you on the slide now, but uh, just to give you an idea, it's, it's in the appendix. The key thing that we, we, we do, which is not maybe in what you've seen in the books, is, is how we model the inflation expectations. So in the Phillips curve, as in Clary, uh, Gali, and Gertler, and these models, you have inflation expectations are, are a mixture of backward-looking. Inflation expectation for next year is what it was this year. Right? And also a forward-looking component, so rational expectations. And the, basically, it's a, so it's a hybrid, a mixture. And the weight that you put on the backward-looking component, so you believe, you, you base your expectations of what's recently happened. You don't buy some announcement about future targets. If, if, if you see this distinction, the weight on this backward-looking component in our model depends on how well the central bank has performed in terms of meeting its inflation target. So this is endogenous credibility stock, and that stock determines the weight on the backward-looking inflation expectations. So if you've missed your inflation target a lot, you have very low credibility, inflation is going to be completely backward-looking. And why does that matter? It's going to be much harder to bring it down. You're going to have to cause a big fall in output, recession, to get people to lower their wage demands and, and reduce inflation. On the other hand, if you've got very high credibility, there's a blip in inflation, everybody believes that the inflation target, they've got anchored expectations, you, you might not even have to cause a recession. Inflation it will just come down by itself through these great expectations. Right? That's, that's the summary of our model, the, the key, key points. And uh, we're going to do um, two experiments, two main experiments. Well, really only one experiment, but then for different varieties of that. And it's going to be um, a food price shock. International, like the wheat we saw earlier, international prices go up. The small economy doesn't control those. They're just determined in the world market. And uh, they um, are basically an importer of these. We can talk about how that would differ for an exporter, but here, they import food, food prices go up, and uh, we're going to contrast the case where they target core inflation with the case where they target headline inflation. And we're first going to do this for an emerging market where food is 30% of the consumption basket, and there's a low stock of this credibility I told you about before. And the, the red line here is what happens when you're targeting core inflation. And the, the main result is that if you target core inflation here, uh, you get better macroeconomic performance. Why? First of all, what happens when food prices go up? They enter into CPI. So headline inflation goes up. Now, if headline inflation goes up, but you've only committed to targeting core, stabilizing core, which doesn't include the food prices, then you have promised something and you're, you're still doing a better job than if you had uh, promised a target to, to stabilize CPI inflation, which is being hit by this big shock. So your credibility is basically insulated from the food prices because you've, you've only committed to targeting core. That's the idea here. So in a sense, you could say you've made your life easier uh, if people will judge you by the target you set yourself, then your credibility will perform better. That's, that's the main thing here. So your credibility, which is, which is this, this variable here, doesn't fall as much with the core framework as it does with the headline. With headline, food prices have dented your credibility just like that. And then, why does that matter? Well, inflation expectations are more backward-looking if you've committed to targeting CPI inflation and you've missed your target because of the food shock. 
So it becomes, it takes a longer time to reduce inflation with the headline. And it requires, as we said, a bigger contraction of output because you have to, uh, you know, really pull that inflation using output and not relying so much on the forward-looking behavior. And that requires a bigger tightening interest rate. And a bigger appreciation of the real exchange rate. So it's a more painful process if you if you've lost credibility because you committed to CPI stabilization. Now, how does that? Uh, how robust is this? I showed you this chart. Let me just go back. This chart was based on a certain calibration of uh, the the loss function. This is the preferences the central bank has between inflation and output. It was just equal weights. And that generates this chart. Here we've shown you for all of the weights possible. This is the so-called policy uh, frontiers. You may have seen this in the monetary policy literature. As we said, I don't know if you've, you've heard of this policy frontiers. Um, so essentially, you've got the output gap outcomes here. How, how stable is output? This way is better, more stable output. And this is inflation of, of variance. Down is better. So the ideal place you'd want to be is somewhere where I am now, with very low volatility. Right now, this, these charts, the red line shows you what is possible under the core framework, and the blue line shows you what is possible under the CPI framework. And as in the picture before, you see that you can basically get a, if you like, Pareto improvement by using the core framework. You get lower. You're usually southwest. Southwest meaning you're, you're, you prefer these dots to those dots. And uh, only if you have a very, so the indifference curve, by the way, this is like the budget constraint, if you like, this is what you can achieve. The indifference curves here are basically the central bank's preferences. If you've got very flat indifference curves, uh, you basically only care about inflation, because you're basically moving up and down like this. You don't care how much you move here. Then you're going to probably zoom down to this blue area here. And this is where the weight on um, inflation is just, you know, you only care about inflation. And you have to pay, though, with much higher output volatility. So this means, overall, that you can still choose the CPI. You may still want to choose the CPI framework, but you'll only do that if you're extremely concerned about inflation and don't care about the, all the extra output volatility. Right, now, here's a second uh, version of this experiment for an advanced economy with a very low food price, uh, food, food component in the basket. Only 10% of the, the basket is now food. And, and very high credibility in line with the early stylized facts. What happens now? We hit with the same shock. International price of you know, food goes up 5% and stays. By the way, I should have said it's a permanent shock to the price level. It goes up 5% and stays high. And um, almost nothing happens in this economy. Why? First of all, food prices, are, a food is a very small share, so it doesn't have as much of an impact on the consumption basket. Second reason, second thing to note here is that the difference between the two frameworks is, is small. That's partly because the shock is smaller. And, and the, the other point is that because of the stronger credibility, uh, the, the loss of credibility is, is smaller under the headline framework than it was in, in the emerging market. So the advantages of having the core framework are less apparent here. The advantage is where you don't lose credibility as much. The credibility loss is here is very small, so there isn't really much between these two frameworks. Okay, That's for advanced economies. So, wrapping uh, this up, based on that analysis, we say that there are definitely benefits from, under, from targeting core or sometimes more broadly referred to as underlying inflation that can actually deliver greater macro stability. Now, just a few words on this underlying in the real world. So, in the real world, it's not just food and non-food as in our model. This is actually done in quite a few countries in, a, in, a, in the following sense. They, they exclude things like fresh food and fresh vegetables from the, for example, in Japan. The inflation target of the Bank of Japan is based on CPI excluding fresh food. So they, they target a core. You know that in the, in the US, the Fed doesn't have an explicit number. But everybody knows that uh, the preferred measure of inflation is core PCE inflation. Right? 
uh, price of consumer expenditures. So uh, this is this is the sort of spirit of what we're talking about. Yet another version of this, which is a bit further away but still consistent with the general idea, is a lot of central banks, like the Bank of England, they have a target in terms of CPI inflation, but it's a, a forecast of where CPI is two years from now that has to be on target. They have to show in their inflation reports that two years from now that inflation will be at 2%. And so it's, they're targeting a forecast. Why is that similar to this? Because it embodies the persistent, the more slow-moving, persistent elements, and it will typically filter out these short-run shocks to food prices. That's that's how it's similar. Okay, those are the, the sort of main results. And then we did some more simulations in, in the chapter, which give you the following two messages. When today, countries already have inflation above target, and the output output is, is overheating and then they have a food price shock on top of that they really need to tighten policy a lot more than say uh, a lot of advanced economies that are in an output slump with high unemployment with inflation you know at or below the target if those countries get hit by a, a food price shock they can just look through that and focus on stabilizing output and just gradually raise rates back to normal over time so uh, that wasn't too long and uh, be happy to answer any more questions on this or more broadly on the outlook or if you have any questions uh, in general on the IMF. Yeah. I have questions. Uh, uh, in your story, you refer to the food. Uh, but uh, another commodity and which is more important for Russia is oil. And uh, it's interesting that uh, for oil, uh, it might be that story is not full of big about. Uh, because at least gasoline price uh, reacts uh, very um, uh, very fast in developing in developed countries uh, to oil pr oil price. So it's uh, really um, not the sort of uh, uh, food price from food commodity price. But and then uh, this uh, price of gasoline goes into uh, um, other goods. Uh, more than other goods, so it might be more complicated story with uh, oil rather than this food. Uh, thanks a lot for that question. I, I would say uh, for countries in this region, uh, what some of the key messages that I would sort of put on the table that are related to this chapter are that the importance is to stabilize inflation expectations and you can do that, I didn't really elaborate on this much, but it's very, very important to have a clear communication framework. We very clearly explain the objectives of monetary policy and why inflation is high and what you're going to do about it to bring inflation down. And that, that, that really can stabilize the, the economy. That's a very important message. But the more detailed issues that you raise about oil prices, there is a, a sense in which it's similar to this food price shock. And it's that oil prices that we saw at the beginning are very volatile as well. So if you're trying to build credibility as a central bank, uh, you you want to target something you can hit, essentially. If, you, if you're targeting the oil price to, to the extreme, then you're going to be constantly off. And that, that that's the way it's similar. But the, the, the issue is that, as you said, food price, oil prices have a, an effect on every, uh, many other things, transport, etc., in a very immediate, direct way. So to that extent, I would say that uh, the sort of underlying measure, if, it, if it's going to have, or if oil prices are going to have this longer term effect, or medium term, then the, the, the central bank should, should include those sort of second round effects, the more projected effects, in the measure it's in targeting. Um, so sort of measure of underlying inflation should ideally incorporate those deeper, deeper uh, factors. Uh, the other thing I want to mention in this context is, is a lot of countries uh, are exporters of oil. And actually, um, exporters of energy in this, this region is quite a few. We looked at an importer of the international product. Now, how does this change if you do an export? If you're an exporter, we have a box on this, and the, the, the good news for an exporter is that, well, if commodity prices go up, international commodity prices go up, that's like a terms of trade improvement for you. So that's going to boost your production. 
And so the central bank is in this lucky position of having what Blanchard and um, Gali called divine coincidence. They, they have output and inflation going up. Inflation goes up partly because of oil prices, but also because of the boom in activity. And so by tightening monetary policy, they can hit two birds with one stone. Very different case here, where you're an importer and you've got a trade-off. You know, oil prices go up, you're an importer. So inflation goes up, output goes down. Then to fight inflation, you have to suffer a bigger output drop. That goes away with, with uh, the exporter position, which is, which is uh, good news for some economists. Other questions? You, uh, USA used to be a country with uh, a low inflation uh, and uh, uh, relatively low unemployment. But now the situation is uh, the opposite. And uh, what are the reasons? And uh, what's USA going to do with it, with this problem? Which oh, country did you say? You, you, the USA. USA? Yeah. Oh, well, I, I agree that now there is high unemployment. Uh, but actually, I would gently disagree with. The, the statement that there's high inflation. I, I would say that uh, if you look at um, various indicators, uh, inflation is really totally under control, uh, well, very close to the sort of preferred level. Um, it's, it's low, basically. It's what's, what's high is unemployment. And it's, a, it's the similar cases in, in several advanced economies. Inflation has, has why is it low? It's big, partly these are related. High unemployment, usually through the Phillips curve. That's what's going on. There's, there's a low, if you look at wage data, you see that wage inflation is very low in the US. And, and unfortunately, um, uh, well, well the, not, the good thing about that, in terms of a policymaker, uh, monetary policy, is that by, by keeping interest rates really low, uh, you know, that there's no sort of immediate danger of, of, of inflation going up. You can focus on this other objective, which is keeping, trying to reduce unemployment. And actually, that's one of the, the recommendations we'll see here. More questions? So, thank you very much. Thank you very much.